join us. Uh, I will comment more about that uh, to tell you who we have speaking and mm -hmm. emceeing, and I'm sure uh, we will see you back at that event, if not sooner. I want to, uh, Dai is uh, 55 chapters strong, and we have uh, our CEO of Dai Global, usually in, in Silicon Valley, he's a San Diegan who's had to spend four years uh, building up the ecosystem, and today we are lucky to have him here, so I'm going to ask him to come up. I'm sorry, Seren, uh, you can come back to your dinner. Um, Seren Dutia is our, the CEO of Thai Global. Please welcome Seren. Thank you, Anil. This is really my home chapter and I'm delighted to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, did you enjoy the outdoor event that we had, cocktails? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many of you are coming here for the first time? Quite a few. Okay, I must confess, this is the first time I've been here in a while, but I used to attend each and every event. And I did that for pretty close to four years. Uh, before I moved to Silicon Valley. So I'm just delighted to be here. It's a treat to be here. As Anil pointed out, and he's asked me to just tell you briefly what uh, Thai is. Thai is the world's largest nonprofit organization in the entrepreneurship space. We have 13,000 members, 55 chapters, in 13 countries on five continents. Thai's mission is pretty singular. We exist for one purpose only, to advance or to foster entrepreneurship globally. And we achieve this through exactly the kind of event that you are here for today. You have an opportunity to network with an amazing group of people in a very informal setting Pretty soon you will have an opportunity to learn something, so that's the education part. And finally, you also have an opportunity to be mentored by individuals who are successful and accomplished. So three pillars of Thai are networking, education, and mentoring. And that's how Thai achieves its mission of uh, fostering entrepreneurship. Thai is an amazing organization which began in Silicon Valley only in 1992-93. It became so enormously successful that in 1997-98, some of us who were outside Silicon Valley, I happened to be here in San Diego, a group of us decided to start a chapter in Los Angeles. We call it Tri Southern California. About the same time, a Boston chapter was getting started. And I clearly remember how this chapter got started. A gentleman who is right here, who occasionally came to our events in LA, Robert Kibble, and he said, we got to get chapter going in San Diego. Why don't we do this? So in June 2000, we launched the San Diego chapter. So basically, from 1992 to 1997, we had only one presence, Silicon Valley, 1997, 98 to 2002, we had quite a growth. And then in 2002, under the leadership of a gentleman who probably doesn't need any introduction, because Thinkers 50 calls him the number one management guru in the world, Professor C.K. Pralat, who is here with us, he had this vision of creating the largest network of entrepreneurship globally. So in 2002, we created an umbrella called Thai Global. And since then, we have doubled the size of our ecosystem. So we've gone from 28 chapters to 55 chapters, and we've gone from a handful of countries to 13 countries. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have this brief introduction. Again, Thai is an inclusive organization. 
It's, it does not stand for anything. It's just acronym type with a tagline, fostering entrepreneurship globally. That's our mission. And we are delighted all of you are here. And I hope you'll keep coming. Anil. Here I knew I couldn't pass up an opportunity to get him to speak. Uh, it happens that his better half was absolutely instrumental in creating this chapter and continues to give a lot back to us uh, in the Thai ecosystem. Jazz Graval, please come on up. to talk to you about three quick things. Um, the first thing is really to tell you uh, about uh, our 10th anniversary. This chapter was started right here at the Women's Club in June of 2000. And so this year will be our 10th anniversary. And as Anil mentioned, we are planning a big celebration. It will be on Coronado Island. It'll be on June 19th, which is a Saturday. Marshall's going to be our MC. <laughs> CK is going to be there uh, and, and uh, you know, share some of his words of wisdom with you. We have uh, a couple of awesome speakers coming. Uh, you may or may not have heard, uh, the Obama administration has a CTO. The gentleman's name is Amish Chopra. He's not been to San Diego, but he's going to come to San Diego for the first time to our event. And so it'll be wonderful to hear uh, his, his thoughts and his vision on where what he sees for the country. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's uh, CTO, uh, a gentleman named P.K. Agarwal, will also be here. So we'll have uh, some you know, wonderful high profile folks. We're planning lots of entertainment, some fun, and we hope that you will join us. Uh, we will be communicating information to you. So I hope, uh, pardon me? Yes, okay. So please look for that information. We hope you'll support us. It really is a wonderful thing to celebrate. Um, I was handed a program for another chapter that celebrated their 10th anniversary. And as I was flipping through there, I actually came across two wonderful quotes from, from their members. And I thought in line with uh, membership, I really wanted to share these with you. Because I think you know, we've been around 10 years, but it's because of a lot of wonderful volunteers that put in the time and effort. But more than the volunteers, we really need all of the participants to support us with membership. It's $100 a year for this chapter, and I was shocked that Atlanta charges $125. So I don't know, maybe we should be charging more than them. You know, we are La Jolla after all. But I, I want to read this to you. This is a gentleman, uh, Michael Horton, managing partner of Horton CC out of Atlanta. He said, Thai is simply the best bargain in town. The monthly meetings start with a tasty Indian dinner buffet, even a glass of wine or beer is included, and it's in the company of the movers and shakers of the local community. The t presentations that follow are always given by true subject matter experts and have been of exceptional quality. Where else can you get all of this for an incredibly low annual dues of $125? And I would say our speakers have been awesome for the 10 years. If I made a list, and we will do that for our 10th anniversary, you'll be impressed by who has traveled across the country and sometimes across the globe to be here with you on that evening and you have access to them. The other is actually from a young entrepreneur, and he talks about his mentoring uh, success, and it's a bit long, so I'm just going to say that the mentor that he worked with, um, he said, through our conversation, he asked all the right questions that helped trigger the necessary thoughts that I hadn't even explored or even imagined. He was also candid and kept it real on what works and what doesn't work based on his experience and knowledge. He helped lay out the next steps and options for me based on my current situation, standings, and desire. And I can truly say that he knew what he was talking about and that he had done it before. I would highly recommend the Thai Mentor Program for individuals who are scratching the surface of starting their own business to spice the field. And that's really another benefit uh, of, of uh, Thai membership. And so I saw a lot of hands go up. You folks are here for the first time. Uh, please consider supporting us. And as you'll find out, bit later in the day, there's some other benefits for having uh, be a member. The third reason that I'm here is many of us here in the Thai world do support the San Diego Museum of Art. 
uh, in Balboa Park. They have an awesome uh, collection of Indian miniature paintings and South Asian art. There are your next speaker for Thai is going to be a gentleman named Ashok Rao. He's an incredible entrepreneur having had uh, success with two or three companies and his most recent fun experience in entrepreneurship is in filmmaking. We are screening two of his films, one this Sunday at the Museum of Photographic Arts, and you have flyers on your table. It's called The Faraway Bride. It's a fun romantic comedy, and if you're interested, if we'll, we'll honor, uh, since membership is what we're talking about, we'll actually give you the museum membership rate if you want to go ahead and buy tickets today. Jolly Desai is somewhere in this room. Uh, there she is in the back waving her hand. You can buy tickets from her or you can come and see me. On the 28th, a show other film called The Whisperer will be screened also at MOPA. The proceeds from both of these films are going to go to support nonprofits. The Whisperers has actually not been released in the U.S., so actually San Diego audiences will be the first to see it. So I hope you will consider coming to the films and perhaps come back and, and uh, hear Ashok speak about his journey as an entrepreneur. Thank you. I should add that Ashok also is uh, or has been the president of Thai Houston. Uh, so he is a stalwart of Thai as well. Um, you may notice, uh, if some of you have been here before, I'm never without a jacket. But I saw our keynote speaker, and uh, on the good advice of my better half, I chucked it. So, uh, I, <laughs> besides we are getting set for uh, uh, next month's event, uh, being green anyway, so I'll get a head start on that. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, our business leader, thinker, um, from his official bio, but please, this is excellent to hear. You have some of it in there, but I'd, I'd like to go through this. In November 2009, Dr. Goldsmith was recognized as one of the 15 most influential business thinkers in the world in the biannual study sponsored by the London Times and Forbes. This is the Business Thinkers 50 that uh, you heard about. And uh, we are truly blessed. We have two of them right here at the same table. Where else would you find it? They're both charter members of Thai, San Diego. The American Management Association named Marshall as one of 50 great thinkers and leaders who have influenced the field of management over the past 80 years. He is one of only two educator, educators who have won the Institute of Management Studies Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Goldsmith is from my school, uh, UCLA. I was from engineering. He's, I guess, uh, Anderson School. He teaches executive education at Dartmouth's Duck School and frequently speaks at leading business schools. He's a fellow of the National Academy of Human Resources. This is uh, the top HR honor, honor that anybody could get. And his work has been recognized by almost every professional organization in his field. In 2006, this is significant, Alliant International University, and there's a few of you from that university here, honored Marshall by naming their School of Business and Organizational Studies the Marshall Goldsmith School of Management. I think a great honor. He is one of a select few advisors who have been asked to work with over 120 major CEOs and their management teams. He served on the board of the Peter Drucker Foundation for over 10 years. And um, Marshall has 28 books. If you go to his site, you can see uh, the one that we had him speak three years ago, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, was number one on the New York Times bestseller list then, and I'm sure has won a lot of uh, other awards. There's others, Succession, Are You Ready? A Memo to the CEO, uh, the AMA Handbook of Leadership, uh, and we are here to listen to his latest uh, effort, uh, the book that you all uh, either, yes, you all have, um, Mojo, How to Get It, How to Keep It, and How to Get It Back When You Lose It. I hope I put the right emphasis. Thank you. <laughs> Please, our keynote speaker. Can somebody tell me how to use the mic? Mic, mic, mic. And the slides. How do I do that? 
Oh, okay, you know how to do the slides as well? Testing, can you hear me okay? Can you all hear me? And how do the slides work? Ah. Oh, that's all right, I'll use this mic, it's fine. And, and how do the slides work? Oh, just those things. Okay, I've got it. You can see we have a lot of technical genius here in the room, right? <laughs> yes. What's that? Oh, yeah, slide the podium back, sure. Now, before we get started, I'll briefly introduce myself and we will begin. I'm Marshall. I'm from Kentucky, went to school in Indiana, got a PhD at UCLA, I was a college professor, I was a dean. And for 33 years, I've been doing three things. One is I teach classes or give talks like tonight. This is what, what other organization does the CEO hand out books? Let's hear it for the CEO, yes. <laughs> now, there is a deal about the books. Jess is reminding me. There is a deal about these books. For all people who are getting the books, we would like to see a nice donation to Ty. And by the way, to keep life simple, reach into your pocket, get out some money, put it on the table, and leave it on the table. That way we won't have to worry about money. Get out, honey. Or become a member of Ty. Then you don't have to give the donation. Yes, you become a member or make a donation. So that's that's the fair deal. All right. Now, what are we going to be talking about? Bojo, increasing meaning, happiness, and employee engagement. Now, tonight's session should be strictly voluntary. This is only for people who would rather have happier or more meaningful lives. If any of you would rather have a miserable or empty life, you should not come to tonight's program. This is only for the ones who'd rather have happier or be more meaningful lives. Now, what are our goals? Number one, create, help people create lives for themselves and others that are filled with two things. Short-term happiness, short-term satisfaction or happiness, and long-term benefit or meaning. Increase employee engagement without another expensive program, and then coaching for a better work life. So those are our goals tonight. Employee engagement at the United States is an all-time low. And I'm gonna give you a different way to look at this topic, rather than, and I'm not saying the other approaches are wrong, but rather than an approach that says, let's talk about the company and say, what can the company do to make you engage? Challenge individuals. Ask them a question, what can you do to make you engaged? Okay, next slide. Uh, publication, oh by the way, I have a website. My website is called mojothebook.com. I've got all kinds of free computer apps. I've got uh, Blackberry apps, we've got uh, iPhone apps, and our friend from LG, LG is in the process of making computer apps to go with the LG cell phones as well. So yours is coming. So we've got all kinds of good computer apps coming. And one of the computer apps is called the Mojo Meter. Now, let me describe how the Mojo Meter works. I think this is going to be, a, and the computer apps are all free, by the way. Oh, also, I have a website called Marshall Goldsmith Library. I give everything away. So all my material, you may copy, share, download, duplicate, use in charity, use in nonprofit, use in business, use anything you want, use any way you want to. I give everything away anyway. Um, I give away uh, things in PDF file and in Word file. Somebody told me, you should never give anything away in a Word file. I said, why not? They said, people could change it. I don't care. Change it away. <laughs> it doesn't make any difference to me. Put your name on it. It's fine with me. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> so if you go to mojothebook.com, one of the applications is called the Mojo Meter. Now, I really like the Mojo Meter. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of how I got into the Mojo Meter. But before we do that, one thing I love is peer coaching. I have a peer coach. UC Berkeley is practicing peer coaching with the Haas Business School with their fully employed MBAs. Peer coaching is fantastic, and we're going to practice right now. You now have 20 seconds to find one person in this room to be your peer coach. Your marks can sit. Go. Find a partner. Go. 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 Find a partner. <laughs> Okay, no trios here, no trios. We're not that kind of an organization. Everybody get one partner. If you don't have a partner, stand up and find a partner. Everybody gets one partner. Now, in peer coaching, you are not here to judge your partner. You're not here to critique your partner, and you're not here to put your partner down. You are here to help your partner. I want you to shake hands with your partner and say, partner, my name is, I'm here to help. Go, shake hands. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, stop, stop. Now, what matters in life? What matters in life? I've had the privilege at my house twice here and once in New York. My second home is in New York. Where, Hell's Kitchen. Yes, Hell's Kitchen, right, yes. A little bit different than Fairbanks Ranch, by the way. Just a tad different. Hell's Kitchen is a little different. Very trendy and, and youthful in the area. So, I've got a home in New York, a uh, home out here, and I've done three programs with CEOs, or people who are close to CEOs who are my age, and they're going to talk about what to do with the rest of my life. Wonderful programs, wonderful programs. And we ask people, what's meaningful? And by the way, a couple of people have had some big career changes. One of the people that came to our first program is a man named Alan Malala. Alan is now the CEO of Ford Motor Company. He was at Boeing at the time. He decided to leave Boeing at our house. Uh, Mark Tursik is head of the Nature Conservancy. He left Goldman Sachs, and he's now running the Nature Conservancy. So we had some great experience of people coming to the house. And we ask a question, what matters in life? And these are people that really have a lot of choices. What really matters? Well, we only came up with five things that matter. Number one is health. If you don't have your health, the rest of this stuff doesn't matter a whole lot. CK, you were talking about this. It's hard to help others be healthy if you're not yourself. So the first person you have to take care of is who? The person right here. The second thing is wealth. And wealth is interesting in the sense of comparing wealth and happiness. The number is about, in the United States, sixty-five dollars to $80,000 a year. After you make sixty-five dollars to $80,000 a year, there's no correlation at all between wealth and happiness. People that make more money are not more happy, nor are they less happy. There's just no correlation. Wealth is a matter only up to kind of a middle to upper middle class factor. And these people obviously have more wealth than they're ever going to spend. So wealth is important, but only to a degree. The third factor that's critical is relationships. And my daughter, Dr. Kelly Goldsmith, and I have done some research, and um, we did something called the Mojo Survey, and we looked at a variety of factors in life. How do you spend your time? Very important to spend time with people you love. Now, here's an interesting question. People that spend more time with people they love not only had higher overall satisfaction with life outside of work, which is not surprising, they had higher overall satisfaction with life at work significantly higher overall satisfaction with life at work. Now, we didn't do any causal analysis of why. I'm not sure why. You're going to talk to your partner 20 seconds and come up, why do you think people that spend more hours with people they love had higher overall satisfaction with life, not only at home, but also at work? Talk to your partner. Go. Why? Go, 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 go. Why? <laughs> Okay, stop. All right. Why? I'll repeat what you said. Everybody here. Why? I think they realize the importance of relationships at work. You think they realize because of the relationships at home, it helps them realize the importance of relationships at work. Okay. Why? <laughs> By the way, I told you you need to work on that assertiveness thing, right? You know, pointing at her is not so good, right? But go ahead, try again. Why? Why? Uh, well, relationships need the energy outside work that you can bring. Relationships give you the energy outside work that you can bring back. Okay, why? Um, because the strength of uh, relationship comes inside of work and home. And home. And again, I don't know the answer to this question, why we didn't do that research. It is an interesting question. The fact there is a correlation, though, is not a theory. That's a very well-documented statistical fact. And then we get into the final two factors that are related to what matters in life, happiness and meaning, and that's what tonight's about. I'm often asked a question. What are the unique qualities of people you would define as successful in life? And to me, if I had to pick a, an answer, the answer is they're spending a great deal of their life engaged in activities that do two things at once. One, make them happy, and two, they're meaningful. If you've got enough help, if you're healthy, you've got enough wealth to have a middle class life, you have good personal relationships, what else matters? Well, the only thing else that matters is you're doing what makes you happy, and you're doing what is meaningful for you. And the other thing that's different about this book than the last, no one can define happiness and meaning for you, but you. Nobody can tell you what this means but you. Oh, thank you very much. Now, building relationships, we've talked about. And one thing I ask people to do on building relationships is get in the habit of asking, how can I be a better? How can I be a better? 
Now, we have a gentleman from LG who went to my class before, and his wife is here. And he was supposed to ask her how he can be a better husband. I think he missed that part of the program. <laughs> so one of the things I'm going to suggest is you get in the habit of asking those people around you, how can I be better in terms of building relationships? And we talk about something that's called feed forward, which is real important. But I'm not going to talk much about that tonight. That was in the last book. Go to the next slide. Mojo. Now, what is Mojo? This is what's called an operational definition. I had the privilege of being mentored by a man named Dr. Paul Hersey. He taught me the value of operational definitions. It doesn't say it's the right definition. It's just a definition I'm using for this book or this program. Mojo is that positive spirit toward what you are doing now that starts from the inside and radiates to the outside. And Mojo is readily visible. Let's take airlines. Have any of you seen the movie uh, Up in the Air? I actually have the card with 10 million frequent fly miles on American Airlines. So I do have the card. You've seen the card. I do have the card. Well, I see flight attendants all the time. One flight attendant is positive, upbeat, motivated, enthusiastic, and finds the work meaningful. Another flight attendant on the same plane is bitter, negative, cynical, and angry. They're on the same plane. They get the same company. They get the same customer. They get the same pay. They have the same benefits and the same uniform. What's the difference? Well, the difference is not what's on the outside. The difference is what's on the inside. And if we look at the concept of mojo, it's really not focused on what's coming from the outside. It's what's coming from the inside. Next slide. Now, mojo is a function of the person, the activity, and the time. Our mojo changes constantly as we go through life. Uh, you may have, as a human, a little more mojo than she has. On the other hand, for certain activities, she may have more mojo than you, and our mojo toward any activity is going to vary as we wander through life. You might have high amounts of mojo at a certain point in time, and de decreasing or increasing at another point in time. Okay, next. Now, happiness and meaning cannot be defined from the outside, can only be defined from the inside. And when I talk about our survey results, you'll see why this is true. These are my th favorite three lines in the book. Our default reaction in life is not to experience happiness. Our default reaction in life is not to experience meaning. Our default reaction in life is to experience inertia. Inertia is incredibly powerful. We all tend to do what we've been doing, go where we've been going, be where we've been being, and say what we've been saying. It is very hard to break the spell of inertia. And one of the things I like about the mojo meter is it's designed to help you break the spell of inertia. Now, let me give you an example. Let's imagine you have to go to a meeting. It's a boring meeting. How many of you work in big companies? Any of you work in big companies? A few of you do. Well, pretend you've got to go to a boring meeting, a stupid meeting, lots of PowerPoint slides. Or if you're in school, a boring class. Not one taught by you or me, but one of the boring instructors, of course, right? You've got to go to a boring class, and you're dreading it, but you've got to spend an hour anyway. You have no choice. Here's the way the mojo meter works. At the end of every activity, you're given a challenge. The challenge is on two questions. How happy was I during this last event? And how meaningful was this? Here's my theory. My theory is if you knew you were going to have to evaluate yourself on how happy you were and how meaningful <coughs> was this, you would have a different experience in that meeting. Why? That hour's gone anyway. That's your life. That hour of your life is gone. Now, option A, you can make the best of it, or option B, you can be miserable. And if you're miserable, guess who's being miserable? Guess whose life is going down the drain? That's your life. You're going to talk to your partner. I want you to imagine you had to go to this boring meeting. You were dreading it. But you knew you were going to get evaluated on happiness and meaning at the end of that meeting. You knew you were going to have to fill out a form. Talk to your partner, 20 seconds. What's something you could do to increase the amount of happiness or meaning you experienced at this meeting? Go, 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 go. Talk to your partner. What I would do is I Okay, stop. What is one thing you could do? What would it be? For me, any amount of new learning that I can Any amount of new learning. You could look at the meeting as an opportunity to learn. Excellent. What's one thing you could do? Yes. Yes. 
Text. <laughs> right here. Text. And by the way, this is a good point. As long as nobody sees you, who cares? <laughs> Some people said, let's just take notes, not about this meeting. Let's find something relevant to take notes about. Nobody can tell the difference anyway. And they see him taking notes like a little beaver, right? And I look like I care, but I really totally checked out. What's well, better than sitting there listening to trivia? What else could you do? Lisa. <laughs> I, I said, uh, listen with one ear and plan my next vacation. Plan your next vacation. <laughs> All right, now I'm going to give everyone in this room a challenge tonight. At the end of the next 45 minutes, you're going to have to take a test. And the test is going to be, how happy were you during the last 45 minutes? <laughs> and how meaningful was the last 45 minutes? And I'm going to give you a challenge. Make the next 45 minutes as meaningful as you can. Make the next 45 minutes as meaningful, and have as good a time as you can. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Now, the changing nature of life. We live in a very, very different world. Uh, CK and I were talking about this. We live in a very different world. Globalization. Globalization is tough. I think it's going to be tough in all of the, quote, I should say the formerly rich countries where we are. We live in a formerly rich country. But I, I think globalization is going to be very tough in what used to be the rich countries. I mean, I'm very proud of my daughter, Kelly. She just got her PhD at Yale. When she entered the PhD program, there were 22 students. How many were born in the United States of America of the 22? That would be one. That would be her. And these kids were not there to get drunk and go to parties. They were very, very, very serious students. Well, global competition is very, very tough, and it's tough on different levels. New technology, the economic crisis, work-life balance, and if you can hit the next slide, I'm going to talk about the changing nature of work from two perspectives. First, blue-collar work. I do not believe at all in the concept of the greatest generation. I think that's silly. I don't think that some generation is better as human beings than other people, and another generation is worse as human beings than others. I don't think my parents were any better than my children or my grandchildren. I don't believe in that at all. I think the generation that in the past was the lucky generation. And in the book, I talk about an example I call Grandpa Bob. Grandpa Bob was lazy. He wasn't that smart. He got zero continuing education. He did mediocre work at best, had a job in a union, and he worked for 30 years, from age 22 to 52, retired, got wonderful lifetime health care benefits and pension, doing work that was less skilled than a McDonald's employee. Grandpa Bob wasn't great. He was lucky. He was a white male born in the United States, when if you were a white male born in the United States who could simultaneously walk and chew gum, you could make the middle class. <laughs> Those jobs are gone. And it's not just on the blue collar level, it's on the white collar level. In 1980, my biggest client was IBM. I would go to Armok, New York at 4 o'clock in Armok, New York, 4 p.m. You could shoot a cannonball down the hall and hit nobody. These people worked 35, 40 hours a week, and they took five weeks of real vacation. Now, it's hard to imagine this today. Real vacation without computers and cell phones. They had real vacations. Those same people today work 60 to 80 hours a week and take no weeks of real vacation. It's tough out there. It's not going to go back to the old days. Those jobs are gone. Now, if you're working 35 and 40 hours a week and you don't love what you do, it's not so bad. You've got a whole other life out there. If you're working 60, 80 hours a week and you don't like what you do, you're living in a bad place called New Age Professional Health. And too many people live there today. I think very important for young people today, they need to realize life is going to be very challenging. It's not going to go away. And if you want to be a successful professional, you're going to have to work. Now, let me give you the good news about work. My daughter and I did research on comparing the number of hours in a week you work with your experience of happiness and your experience of meaning. And you know what we found out? Absolutely no correlation. No correlation between the amount of hours you work and happiness. No correlation between the hours of work and meaning. I work all the time. I'm happy. I like what I do. If you like what you do, you don't mind working. And if you don't like what you do, you're miserable. Well, the reality is there is no correlation at all between how you, how you experience that happiness and meaning in life. Next slide. Now, we're going to get back to work. I want everybody to start thinking about your own lives. Achieving both personal and professional success, we can look at life and every activity from the perspective of short-term gratification or happiness long-term benefit or meaning. And we'll talk about various places you can spend your time. The first box is called surviving. 
surviving, that's low amounts of short-term satisfaction or happiness and low amounts of long-term benefit or meaning. A stimulating, that would be high amounts of short-term gratification or happiness, low amounts of long-term benefit or meaning. Sacrificing, well, you're doing something that's meaningful, but you don't enjoy it. And if you spent your whole life there, you'd be a martyr. Sustaining is kind of moderate amounts of both. Those things don't make us real happy or make us sad. They're not that important or unimportant. And then finally, to me, the characteristic of a successful human being, a lot of your life is spent what I call succeeding. We're doing something that produces high amounts of short-term gratification or happiness and high amounts of long-term benefit or meaning. Now, I'm going to ask you to talk to your partner. We're going to start with surviving. Give me one element of your life, one activity, where you say, when I spend time here, I call that in the surviving box. Go. Give me, give me one or two elements. Go, 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 go. What is surviving for you? Okay, stop. Stop, stop, stop. Let me call on people. What is one for you? Go ahead. Paying bills. All right, paying bills. All right, what's one for you? Paying taxes. Paying taxes. Right. All right, what's one for you? Commuting. Commuting. All right, very interesting. Oh, what's one for you? Okay. What, what's one for you? Me? It's uh, because I haven't hired a new assistant. But you I'm haven't hired a new assistant, right? Good You're doing work things. you don't want to be doing. Well, we ask thousands of people this question. What does surviving mean to you? The most common word is the word chores chores. And here's an important point. One person's chore is another person's joy. The key is not what does chore mean to somebody else. The key is what does chore mean to you. And to the degree we can in life eliminate that stuff, we're better off. Now, sacrificing, we ask, what, what's in sacrifice? And, and by the way, let me give you one activity to illustrate how this differs with the person's gardening. For some people, gardening was surviving. For some, it was stimulating. For some, it was sacrificing. Uh, for some, it was the dog. The dog doesn't like gardening, by the way. <laughs> for, for some, it's succeeding, and for some, it's sustaining. Well, there's nothing magic about gardening, either good or bad or indifferent. The question is, what does gardening mean for you? And nobody can define what this means for you, but you. Now, I'm going to ask you to talk to your partner again. Give me one element of, element of your life that you would define as succeeding. What's well, one activity where you feel, I really enjoy this, it makes me happy, and at the same time, I think it's meaningful. Go, talk to your partner. Okay, what is succeeding for you? Okay, over here. What is succeeding for you? The kids being well raised, okay? By the way, kids really vary around the board on this one. Some, some people put the kids in every box, right? Now, I'll give you a very interesting thing. When, when people wrote about the kids, they could be in any box. From, it depends if they're teenagers surviving. <laughs> uh, uh, literally, spending time with the kids scored in every box. One thing, though, only scored in one box, spending time with the grandkids. <laughs> that was always in succeeding. Always in uh, How about him? Does he like the grandkids? Of course. Great enjoyable. Yes, he loves the grandkids. Does he spoil the grandkids? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, grandkids were over there. What does succeeding for you? What's one for you? Yeah. Uh, lately, uh, the... Uh, I really enjoy the working, yes. but uh, not before, but uh, when I take ownership, enjoy it, that was a successful. Very yeah. good. Well, you see, the big change maybe wasn't what you were doing. It's the way you approached what you were doing. Now, what's one thing for you that's in the succeeding box? Spending quality time with family. Spend quality time with the family. Very nice. Uh, okay, what's one for you? Oh, I guess either spending time with my wife or my job. Or your job. All right, now you're going to talk to your partner. I'm going to give you a challenge. What is one change you can make in your life to increase the amount of either short-term gratification or long-term benefit that you experience either at work or home? In other words, how can you start spending more of your life over in the succeeding box? To your marks get set, what's one change you can make? Talk to your partner, go, 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 go. <laughs> Okay, stop. Stop.
up. What's one change you can make? More time with the family. Excellent. What's one change you can make? More mentoring. And again, mentoring depends on the person. Some people don't like mentoring. Some do. What's one change you can make? Don't so I came up with spending more time together. Spend more time together. Right. Well, nobody can tell you what that is for you, but you. Let me give you a challenge, though. Start looking at your life. And I'm going to ask you right now, you've got 100 points. You've got 100% of your time. We won't start at home. We'll start at work. You've got 100% of your professional time. You've got five boxes. You've got about two minutes. You're going to talk about what percent of your professional time is spent surviving, stimulating, sacrificing, sustaining, or succeeding. You've got 100 points. You've got two minutes. To your marks, get set, give yourself a score at work. Go. Professional life. Go, 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 go. Go. Individually or Individually, and then talk to each other. By the way, calculate your score and then talk to your partner. Next slide. Next slide. And again, next slide. Okay. Next slide. The Mojo survey. Here are the scores we got from a database of 3,000 people. Percent of time spent in each activity. Now, the one number is work, the other number is home. I ask people to evaluate their own lives, and then I ask people to think of the average employee. And looking at their own lives, people say they're spending about 30% of their time in what you'd call the succeeding mode. They saw the average person at about 15 or 16%. Now, those numbers are skewed for two reasons. One, the database is not a random database. Two-thirds of the people in our survey have graduate degrees. These are readers of my books. This is not a random sample of human beings. And the other reason the data is skewed is we all think we're better than everybody else anyway. So <laughs> one, the group probably is a little higher, but two, they're a little more conceited. So if you add the two together, that's why you see such a discrepancy. Let me tell you some of the things we found, though. If you go on to the next slide, some of the things we found in our research are fascinating. The, the most interesting part of our research to me is there's an incredibly high correlation between scores at work and at home. Now, if you know about statistics, we have a database of 3,000 people. The correlation between hours spent succeeding at work and home, positive 0.6. Now, if you know about statistical significance, that's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, positive 0.6. An incredibly high correlation between people who see themselves achieving happiness and meaning at work, the same people are achieving happiness and meaning at home. Now, what does that tend to tell you? A lot of our experience of happiness and meaning is not about what we're doing. It's who we are. And I think what you look at big corporations is we've almost created this dependency model. What can we do to make you happy? What can we do to make your life meaningful? I think it's much more mature to look at people and start asking them, what can you do to make you happy? What can you do to make your life more meaningful? And my guess is you'll probably get more return out of that than you get out of some corporate program anyway. Um, spending time with people we love, as I mentioned, highly correlated with satisfaction at work or home. Next slide. The only positive correlation with overall satisfaction at work or at home comes with increased hours in succeeding. Now, I'm going to help all of you who are in corporations forget about fun day. The employees don't need to go to work and have fun day. Activities that are trivial yet meaningless do not increase overall satisfaction with life at work. And even more surprising, they don't increase overall satisfaction with life at home. Trivia doesn't work. Now, America 
we, we've got a potential problem in our country. I just read a survey by the Kaiser Permanente Company. It's not in the book because I hadn't read it at the time. According to them, the average American teenager today is spending seven and a half hours a day on non-academic media. Texting, uh, uh, video games, TV, movies, seven and a half hours a day. This is an impending disaster. Let me tell you what our research has shown. Vicarious living doesn't work. People who live their lives through other people do not have more experience of meaning and do not have more experience of happiness. Watching TV doesn't work. People who spend more hours watching TV are not happier with life, not only not at work, but at home. Going to the movies, watching TV, trivia, you can do a little of that, but not too much. If you do too much of it, it's negatively correlated with overall satisfaction of life, not only at work, but also at home. And just increasing short-term happiness does not increase overall satisfaction with life at work or at home. Yes? Has, it, has the data on media changed from the 80s till now in terms of... Oh, yes. And that number's going up. Because I kind of remember we were watching TV for a lot of those hours back in the 80s. Yeah, and it, the number's worse now. The number's gone from bad to worse. So I think very important if we look at this, what does lead to overall satisfaction? And it is very important. I'll, I'll give you an example. Internet surfing, a disaster. How many of you have noticed how easy is it to blow two hours on the internet? Yeah. I mean, you're sitting there, you, you start out with some noble intent, and then two hours later, it's like, you know, what was that about, right? <laughs> well, I think if you knew you were going to be challenged, how meaningful was this, how happy was I, you'd make better use of the two hours. Because it would dawn on you, I'm just wasting two hours here. By the way, people have spent more time on non-professional internet surfing were not only not happier, they had lives that were less meaningful. They were higher in the surviving box. So, you know, not a real good place to be. Now, what are the building blocks of Mojo? Well, four things, and I won't talk about all of them tonight, but we'll get started at least. Identity, achievement, reputation, and acceptance. Go to the next slide. First, we'll start with identity. All right, how do we know who we are? If Mojo is that positive spirit toward what you are doing that starts on the inside and radiates to the outside, who's you? Well, how do we know who we are? Our identity comes, we can look at our identity, and if you go to the next slide, we can look at our identity as kind of a matrix. Oh, go back, go back, excuse me. We can look at our identity as kind of a matrix. If you look at the future past, self and other, you can see where our identity comes from. The first is our remembered identity. What's that? How do you know you're a bad tennis player? Well, you remember events in your life when you were a bad tennis player. It's the past that you remember. The next one is our reflected identity, that's feedback from others. How do you know you're a bad listener? Somebody told you you're bad. You can kind of believe that. Our programmed identity, this is the programming other people give us that shape who we are. Now, I'll give you an example of my own programmed identity. I'm from a small town in Kentucky called Valley Station, Kentucky. My mother went to college for two years, one of the few people that ever went to college. My father had a two-pump gas station. When I was growing up, my mother gave me the following messages about myself. To start with, she said, Marshall, you are smart. She did not say I was kind of smart. She said, you are the smartest little boy in Valley Station, Kentucky. <laughs> Some might say, big deal. She also said, Marshall, you are going to college. She didn't say maybe I was going to college. She said, you are going to college. You can go to graduate school. How many people from Valley Station, Kentucky have PhDs? Me. And she also said, Marshall, you have no mechanical skills, and you will never have any mechanical skills for the rest of your life. <laughs> I'm a little child, I get this message. You have no mechanical skills. How does this message impact my development as a child? I'm never encouraged to be around cars, tools, mechanical things, so I don't learn any of this stuff, right? My friends are all working on cars. I don't participate. I don't know anything. They talk about a universal joint. I thought it was something you smoked. I have no idea what you're talking about, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm 18 years old. I take a test to go to the United States Army. The United States Army Aptitude Test. Have any of you ever taken this test? Part of that test, you may recall, was called the Mechanical Aptitude Test. <laughs> On the United States Army Mechanical Aptitude Test, I scored in the bottom 2% of the entire United States. I scored significantly below random chance. <laughs> Now it was no longer my mother saying I had no mechanical skills. <laughs> my mother and my father, my mother, my father, my friends, the United States Army, and travel 
Same, trained psychologist, all proved. I had no mechanical skills, but I got this. It's not until I'm 27 years old and get a PhD at UCLA that I question this. I take a class from old Dr. Cannonball. He says, piece of paper, what do you do well? What did I write? Scholarly pursuits, research, what was I saying? Smart. What are you no good at? I have no mechanical skills. I will never have any mechanical skills. <laughs> he says, how do you know you have no mechanical skills? Well, I said, it's hopeless. I took a test. Random chance defeated me. <laughs> he said, uh, how's your mathematical skills? Oh, I said, I got 800 on the SAT math achievement test, nine courses of math, past calculus, great mathematical skills. He said, why can you solve complex mathematical problems which you cannot solve simple mechanical problems? Good point. He said, how's your hand-to-eye coordination? I said, I guess it's okay. I could play pinball games, shoot pool, drink beer. He said, why could you play pinball games and shoot pool, but you can't hammer nails? When I was 27 years old, what did I realize? I had no mechanical skills because I had been told I had no mechanical skills. That created a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I lived it out throughout my life. I see this every day with people I coach. Every day. And these are CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. They'll say things like, I can't listen. I look in their ears. Why? Is there something stuck in there? Why can't you listen? Or I, I'm no good at recognizing others. Well, why? Right? Why are you no good at recognizing others? Well, to me, anybody that does not have an incurable genetic defect can change. Now, I'm not going to be an N NBA basketball player. Physiologically, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> On the other hand, the people I coach, how many people I coach have incurable genetic defects that are prohibiting them from doing anything? None. And one thing I've learned about in my coaching is I know that not only need to help people change behavior, I need to help people change identity. Let me explain why. Let's say part of your identity is you're no good at recognizing others. I give you coaching. You start practicing recognizing others. Somebody comes up to you and says you're doing a great job of recognition. If you're not careful, you know what you're going to feel like? A phony. You know what you're going to say? No. I'm just acting like someone who's good at giving recognition. That's not the real me. The real me is no good at that. Well, why is the real me no good at that? There's absolutely no logical reason. Talk to your partner. 20 seconds. Here's your challenge. Give your partner one element of your programmed identity that you could probably change. Go. Go, go, go. <laughs> genetic defect prohibiting you from being a good salesperson? No, no. Mr. Reddy. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> By the way, she doesn't have that problem. Right? <laughs> she likes selling. Okay, CK, what's one programming you can change? Oh, learning to cook. Learning to cook. <laughs> if you have a genetic defect, it's no. prohibiting you from cooking. No. Not at all. Inertia. 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 How about you? What's one thing you can change? Well, you've been programming. Tells me you need to listen to them. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Here we have Rather than taking personal responsibility, <laughs> <laughs> rather than taking ownership himself, right, what does he do? And he's our fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> points at <in> her. <laughs> points at her. Terrible, terrible. Wasn't that awful? <laughs> All right, what's one thing that you're. I want to just, it's good to think about life. Think about these programs we've been given. And then the final part of our identity, and this is what Mojo's about, it's called our creative identity. We can create a new identity. Now, in the book, I talk about a dinner I had with the rock star Bono. I didn't even know much about who Bono was. His records were made after 1975. <laughs> <laughs> Cut me out, right? But I had dinner with this uh, rock star Bono. He wears sunglasses all the time. His eyes are very sensitive, so he wears sunglasses all the time. See, he wears sunglasses even inside. So we had dinner together. And and he talked about identity. It was very fascinating. He was brought up as a regular guy. 
and he still has this identity regular guy. He uses the F word about every third word, right? <laughs> Which is okay with me. I said, I thought, I'm from Kentucky, I thought that was the adjective that preceded all nouns. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't bother me, <laughs> but and he's still a regular guy. Then, then he became a, a rock and roll fan, and he's still a rock and roll fan. His eyes light up, he talked about listening to music, and you know, he's still a rock and roll. Then he became a musician, and he's still a musician. He's not out there doing music just to make money. He loves it. He talked about doing it with his family and all that stuff, you know, and he's not getting paid for this stuff. Then he became a rock star. And I know he was a rock star because he used the term rock star about 10 times just in case I missed it, right? You know? And he didn't say it to be egotistical. That's just who he is. You know? He is a rock star. It's who he is. And it was fascinating having dinner with this rock star. There were 800 people in the room. I learned something about myself that I never knew before. Every time I looked up, beautiful women were staring at me. I never realized how handsome I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, now he's a humanitarian. But he's not a fake humanitarian. He's a real humanitarian. Well, to me, a great example of somebody who created an entire new identity without being phony. And I think one of our biggest concerns about changing our identity is it's not the real me. Well, why doesn't it have to be the real me? The real you can sell. The real you can listen. You know, the real you can cook. You know, she's going, <laughs> your wife did not give you an encouraging look, by the way. <laughs> Her expectations are not real high, are very low. <laughs> so I want to give everybody a challenge, though. Ask yourself, what kind of identity do I want to create for myself? And try not to get limited by stuff that really doesn't have to be there. Next, the second part of Mojo is achievement. Now, I'm, I'm going to challenge you to look at achievement two ways. We historically look at achievement one way. What do I bring to it? But I'm going to ask you to look at achievement a different way. What does it bring to me? Not just what am I bringing to this activity. What is this activity given to me? Next slide. And if we look at achievement professional mojo, that's what I bring to it. And this is pretty standard stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's motivation, it's ability, it's understanding, uh, confidence, uh, authenticity. That's what we're bringing to any activity. And by the way, this applies at home as well as work. Next. I'm also going to challenge you, though, to act, look at the achievement in a different way. What is this activity giving to me? Does this activity make me happy? Is it fulfilling? Do I find it rewarding? Am I supported? And am I thankful for the ability to do this? What's it giving to me? And if we just spend a whole life where we're giving to it, but it's not giving back to us, then we're over in that sacrificing mode, which is not necessarily a great place to spend your life. Next. Mojo test two, if you think about, well, we don't have time to do that next. Go on to the next one. But it's a good test to do. Now, reputation. Now, I'm going to find, with this group, I'm very interested in doing this. Our reputation, that's how the rest of the world sees us. And in my coaching, that's actually what I do. In my coaching, I don't get paid if my clients don't achieve positive long-term change in behavior. Behavior change is not judged by me nor my client. It's judged by everyone around my client. So in essence, I'm paid to help people change their reputation. I have a very good understanding of how hard this is. It is much easier to change behavior than to change perception. Best research principle in psychology, cognitive dissonance theory. We all see people that's consistent with our previous stereotype, and the closer we are to another human being, the deeper that stereotype is. So when you even mention this good cook thing, you should see the look she gave you. It's a highly skeptical look, right? A very dubious look. The closer we are to another person, the less likely we are to believe they're ever going to change. And it is very hard to change reputation. And what I do for a living is basically that. Help people change reputation. I talk about that in the book. But here's what I want to do this group. We're going to do the brain pill test. Are you ready? You have the opportunity to take a pill. As soon as you take this pill, you're going to be 10% smarter for the rest of your life. But the world is going to see you as 20% dumber. <laughs> Question, do you take the pill? Talk to your partner, say yes, no, and why. Go, talk to your partner. Do you take the bill? Yes, no, and why? Take the pill and why? Yes or no? I can't 
Okay, shh, shh. we have a yes. Why yes? I could be more like the people I admire. I could understand more, achieve more. Okay, yes or no? Um, I say no. No, why not? Because I've learned that sometimes perception is reality. Perception is and, reality. Uh, you're judged often by what people think you're the actual you are. Would you take the bill? Yes or no? No. Yes, no. I said yes. I think it's good to be smarter. It's good to be smarter. <laughs> <laughs> well, there isn't a right or wrong answer here. Yeah. Now, I would say no. My job is helping other people achieve positive long-term change in behavior. If I'm seen as 20% dumber, I'm not going to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, somebody might be an artist or interested in creative activities and not really care that much about their reputation with the world. There is no right or wrong answer here. It's a good question. It gets you thinking about how important is reputation and what does it matter to me. And the answer is for some people, maybe not so important. For other people, critically important. Next slide. Mojo case studies. Who has the most and who has the least? And I think it's real good to look at business rather than saying, what can the business do to make you motivated? Just do a little mojo test with the people you need to work every day. Who's high and who's low? Go to a restaurant. Look at the waiters. Look at the waitresses. Look how different their scores are. Go to LG. I'm sure you see people every day who are motivated and enthusiastic and want to be there. And you see people who are totally checked out, doing exactly the same work for the same pay at the same time in the same company. Well, start challenging people not to look at the outside for all the answers. Challenge people to look on the inside. OK, next. Now, there's two ways we can basically achieve acceptance. One is we can change the world. Two is we can change ourselves. That's about it. I'm either going to change me or I'm going to change it. Option C, wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can change me, I can change it, or I can just sit around and whine. Well, my suggestion is either try to change it or try to change me. And that's basically it. And, and if you go to changing it or me, next slide, I'm going to give you one way to help change it. First, what percent of all interpersonal communication time is spent on A? People talking about how smart, special, and wonderful they are are listening to do this. Plus B, people talking about how stupid, bad, or inept someone else is or listening to somebody do that. I want you to take A plus B divided by all interpersonal communication time and give me one percentage number. I've asked thousands of people around the world this question. When you give me your score, I'll tell you how your score compares with the rest of the world. If your marks, get set, go. A plus B divided by all communication time. Talk to your partner 20 seconds. Come up with a number. Go. Go, 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 go. <laughs> what do you think? You have to give me a number? 50. 50. All right. Okay, there is no exact answer. There is no exact answer. Just give me a number. A plus B divided by all communication time. What is that one percentage number? It would be... 20. What, what's your number? 50, 80, 70. 50, 80, 70, 20, 20, 80, 90, 50. The average answer in the entire world, 65%. 65%. What'd you get? We were thinking 66. <laughs> <laughs> now, by, now, now, by the way, in my previous book, I talk about the disease of having to win all the time <laughs> <laughs> and being right. Now, did you notice this? I said the average was 65. She's going, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that was the correct answer. <laughs> I just said it was the average answer. <laughs> there is no correct answer. Well, whatever that number is, it's a huge number. I'm going to give everybody a suggestion. Reduce that number for yourself and your teams. How much did we learn talking about how smart, special, wonderful we are? Nothing. How much did we learn talking about how bad, stupid, or inept other people are? Nothing. How much do people on our teams benefit from this? Nothing. How much of life is wasted on this? Way, way too much. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Now, keeping in mind what matters. Now, this is something that I do every night and I love. Are you ready? Look into the eyes of your partner. 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 
I want you to imagine your partner's gonna call you on the phone every night for the rest of your life. <laughs> every night your partner is gonna ask you questions. The same questions every night. Now I have a peer coach. My peer coach calls me almost every day. We do this almost every day. Every question is yes, no, or a number. He asks me 24 questions, I ask him 17 questions. It is amazing how well this works. It takes five minutes a day. What's the first question he asks me every day? On a one to 10 scale, how happy were you yesterday? I, mean, I don't have to work. Has anybody been to Fairbanks Ranch, California before? Should people that live there whine and complain? What do you think? Not so much. I've got a nice house, I got a nice wife, nice kids. I'm not happy, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'm going to help most of you if you're not happy, you're an idiot too. You're an idiot. Uh, how meaningful was yesterday? If yesterday wasn't meaningful, whose fault is that? When I've never gotten a perfect score on almost in my entire life, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it was not worth it? <laughs> oh, she's, your wife is looking at you right now. <laughs> 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 how many angry or destructive comments did you make about people yesterday? How much did you, how much do you weigh? How many push-ups did you do? How many sit-ups did you do? How many alcoholic drinks did you have? Two is good, 20 is bad. <laughs> well, just a lot of questions. And my partner would tell you this saved his life. What's one question I ask him? Are you currently updated on your physical exam? He said, no, 90 days in a row. After 90 days, he said, this is ridiculous. I have to get the stupid exam or quit asking. You got the exam. The doctor said you had cancer. He's going to be fine. The doctor said, had you waited seven more months, you'd be dead. He's 65. He knew he should have got it. That's a good exam. But when somebody sticks a mirror in your face every day, it's very hard to hide. I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. Imagine somebody's going to call you up on a phone every night, get out that Excel spreadsheet, write a bunch of questions, seven blocks. At the end of the week, the scores are automatically calculated. It is amazing how much more honest we can be with ourselves if we have to fix that every day. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide, next slide. Wait a minute, she likes that Wait, 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 wait. She likes that slide. Wait, wait, wait. Stop, stop. No, we have to. We're clamoring for this slide, right? Okay, stop, stop. Gender differences in leadership feedback. Are you ready? I'm sorry. I, don't want to skip this slide, do we? No, no, no. <laughs> the average woman in 360 degree feedback is seen as a better leader than the average man. Yeah, there's a difference between winning and gloating. <laughs> <laughs> You're beginning to start gloating, aren't you? The only moment you gave me to gloat. Oh, 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 the only moment I can gloat is now. Yeah, show you poor me. Now, winning is good, gloating is bad. The average woman in 360 feedback is seen as a better leader than, or as good as the average man. It's not a theory, it's a fact. Center for Creative Leadership, Mary and Murderman, 300,000 people in a database. For the women in the room, yes. the average woman has one issue to deal with much more than the average man. The desire to be the perfect everything to everyone. Women statistically carry around one thing more than men. What is this called? Yes. Guilt. Oh, how about women from India? Double guilt for you, please. <laughs> from India, double guilt for you, <laughs> special helping. Well, the average woman has more guilt than the average man. With women I coach, there's one coach you have much more than men, you know what it is? Please quit being so hard on yourself. Please quit being so hard on yourself. You can't be that perfect everything to everybody. Men, look up here. Men, <laughs> look up here, please. Yes, men, there are learnings for us in this stupid and unfortunate Center for Creative Leadership Research. Yes, men, we must tell the truth. There's a little bad news for us in this research. Yet, men, there's good news. First, the bad news, according to the idiotic Center for Creative Leadership Research and this dumb study involving 300,000 people, the bad news is, as leaders, let's tell the truth. We're not as good. The good news is, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next slide. <laughs> now it's all making sense, isn't it? You were confused before, right? All right, now we're going to finish. 
I'm going to finish right now. I apologize for being a little bit late, but we're going to finish in about five minutes. This next part of the program is going to focus on one thing. Be happy and let go of guilt. If anybody would rather be miserable and have more guilt, you shouldn't come to this part of the program. This is about being happy and let go of guilt. Is everybody ready? Take a deep breath. For the next few minutes, we're going to have four rules. If you cannot follow these four rules, I must ask you to leave the room. And for some of you, these rules can be difficult to follow. Are you ready? Rule number one, for the next few minutes, you cannot, under any circumstances, attempt to become more productive. None of that. It's going to get harder. Take a deep breath. For the next 10 minutes, you cannot attempt to learn something. It's going to get harder. For the next 10 minutes, you cannot attempt to become a better person. And finally, for the next 10 minutes, you cannot even think about helping others. I want you to spend 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, and focus on one thing, your own happiness and self-acceptance for 10 minutes. I just worked with a large group of women in India. Two women just broke down. They didn't just start crying. They lost it. No one had ever given them 10 minutes. Take a deep breath. Ah. Now I'm going to teach you a good Buddhist happiness technique. Is everybody ready? I want everybody to take a breath and say two words. New me. New me. New me. New me. Say these words. New me. New me. New me. Everything that happened before this second in your life was done by an infinite set of people. You know what their names were? The previous ones. <laughs> the previous ones. Close your eyes. Think of those previous yous. Think about all the gifts they've given to you that's in this room. Think about all they've done for others. Think about how hard they tried. Open your eyes. If any group of people did that many nice things, what should we say to these good people? Thank you. Thank you. Do your hands like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, did they make a little mistake or two? Take a deep breath. Ah, who's the first person we need to learn how to forgive? I've asked tens of thousands of parents around the world this question. When my child grows up, I want my child to be. There's one word that comes up from parents. One word, more than every other word combined, no matter what country I'm in. What's that word? Happy. 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 You want your child to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? You want the people who love you to be happy? You want the people who respect you at work to be happy? You go first. You be happy. Can any of you think, I want everybody to think of one person that makes you feel bad, guilty, angry, or, or crazy. Can everybody come up with one person that makes you feel bad, guilty, angry, or crazy? Everybody got one? Yes. Now I have a question. How much sleep is that person losing over you tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a zero, a zero, a zero, a zero, and a zero. Who's being punished here? Who's doing the punishing? <sighs> Two monks are walking by the street. The monks see a woman and she has on a beautiful silk dress and she's crying. One monk comes over and says, why are you crying? She says, I have on this beautiful silk dress that my mother made, but I must cross the stream to get to the wedding. One monk says, I'm sorry, we, we can't even help you, we can't touch with it. The other monk says, ah, to heck with the rules. Picks her up on the shoulder, carries her across the stream and drops her off the other side. She's so happy. Oh, thank you, good monk, thank you. The monk comes splashing back across the stream. His colleague, the other monk, is angry. You're a bad monk, a terrible monk, a disgusting, bad, bad monk. The wet monk says, why am I bad? We're not supposed to even touch women. Pick the woman up on your shoulders, caring about you. Bad, bad monk, quit to save yourself. The wet monk says, shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> they walk back to the home of monks, all the way back. Bad monk, bad monk. The wet monk dries off and goes to sleep. In the middle of the night, his colleague is still angry. You're a bad monk. The sleepy monk says, why am I bad? The angry monk says, because you carried that woman. The sleepy monk says, the what woman? What woman was that? The angry monk says, the woman you carried across the stream. The sleepy monk said, oh, her. I won't carry her across the stream. 
you carried her all the way back to the monastery. Some of you all have been carrying some people on your shoulders. You know what? These people are not making you happy. Next time you think about those people, take a deep breath. Ah, leave at the stream. I was teaching this to the investment bankers at Goldman Sachs. One of, <laughs> one of their top women investment bankers raised her hand and she goes, excuse me, could I please submerge them in the stream? <laughs> <laughs> Final advice, pick a path through life. Pick a path through life. Nobody can define happiness for you but you. Nobody can define meaning for you but you. Where's that path need to come from? In here. It's your path. Every path through life has trade-offs. Make peace with these trade-offs. Make peace. And don't go through life doing that to yourself. Life is too short. Final story. Farmers are on the boat up the big wide river. He looks upstream and here comes another boat. The boat gets closer to his boat. He says, be careful, be careful, you might hit my boat. Be careful, be careful, it's such a big river. Splat. The boat runs into his boat. The farmer is angry. He stands up and screams, you fool, you idiot, you moron. How could you have hit my boat? It's such a big river. He looks in the other boat. There's no one in the other boat. He's screaming at an empty boat that's floating down the river. <laughs> There's never anyone in the other boat. You know that person making you feel bad, guilty, angry, and crazy? Getting upset with them for being who they are makes as much sense as getting upset with your table for being a table. The table cannot help but be a table. That's what it is. If you had that person's history, family, genes, and life, you'd be them. You don't have to like them, respect them. Next time you think about them, take a deep breath. <sighs> Nobody's in the boat. Final thing is, I had a great time working with you. Hope this helped you have a little better life. <laughs>
So, I mean, I think we have this deified idea of what history was like. Most of the history of the world is brutal. Now, is it perfect out there? Of course not. Are there people who are jerks? Of course there are. On the other hand, I don't think everybody out there is bad by any, man, by any measure. Let me describe it. What's that? How about your client? Oh, my client. I love my clients. But I'll, I'll, I'll describe my favorite client. By the way, you remind me of my favorite client. Let me describe, <laughs> let me describe my favorite client. Does anybody know who General Eric Shinseki is? I had dinner one night with General Shinseki. Just one second. Who was head of the U.S. Army. Was General Shinseki asked me, Marshall, who's your favorite client? And we're in a room filled with two to four star generals. I said, sir, my favorite client is smart, dedicated, hardworking, driven to achieve, creative, entrepreneurial, gets the numbers. Cares about the company, cares about the customer, high degree of personal integrity, good values, gets results. Stubborn, opinionated, know-it-all, but never wants to be wrong. I made a whole room of two to four star generals, and I said, sir, do you think anybody in this room may fit this profile? He looked at me and he said, Marshall, we got a target rich opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I have a shortage of future business. <laughs> I, I, and by the way, I, I hate to say this, don't take it personally, but as I look around this room, you know what I see? A target rich opportunity. <laughs> Do I have anybody in this room who's entrepreneurial, creative, gets the numbers, hardworking, dedicated, intelligent, stubborn, opinionated, know it all? <laughs> yes, question. Yeah. Do you see the problems that we see today in uh, people trying to achieve short term goals? Yes. And then the missing question? the whole big picture of Yes. The, uh, Do I see the problem of people achieving short term goals and missing the big picture? Definite yes. Now, again, I'm biased, I'm a Buddhist. To me, most Westerners do not understand Buddhism. And I'm going to share my interpretation of Buddhism. To me, uh, the first line of Buddhism is life is filled with suffering. I think it's a bad translation. A deeper translation to me is life is filled with existential dissatisfaction, not wailing of suffering. And if you meditate, if any of you ever meditate, there's this little voice that constantly ambers in our mind. The little voice always says the same thing. Things are going to be better when? Tomorrow, next week, or even small things. When I scratch my head, the, the U.S. art form, basically the art form that we have all been brought up with, there's one art form that predominates all. It's a simple art form. It's always the same story. Someone is sad. They spend money. They buy a product. They become happy. <laughs> have any of you ever seen this story before? <laughs> it's called a commercial. Well, the reality is a person is sad. They spend money. They buy a product. Now they have less money and a product. They're not necessarily happier. So I think the great disease is I'll be happier when I get this status, money, all the way from big things, car, to little things. And again, to me, the essence of Buddhism is no, you won't. Happiness doesn't come from out there. It comes from in here. Meaning doesn't come from out there. It comes from in here. Okay, about three more questions. Yes? How do you change your like, reputation with everyone? Like, you really want to change it? Yes. But, like, Yes. Well, first thing is, do you have to hang out with those same people forever? No, it's a question. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you do, this is what I do for a living. Let's say she is the stubborn, opinionated person. She wants to change her reputation. What I do is she gets feedback from everyone around her. She picks important behavior to improve. She develops a plan. I go over it with her. She's not the CEO. The CEO signs off on it. I always do exactly the same thing. She apologizes for her sins to everyone. She involves them on a regular basis. She learns from them. I work with her. We measure, 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 follow up, follow up, follow up. She gets better and I get paid. And in my coaching, in my coaching, if she doesn't get better, I don't get paid. I guess you mean it's identity. How can you change her identity? Yeah, it's identity. First place to start with your identity is yourself. What part of your identity do you want to change? I used to be an academic and I want to be more business. God bless you. <laughs> you want to be more business, all right? It's my mother's fault. She always said I was going to be a writer. I don't want to be a writer. <laughs> <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> now, oh, by the way, first guide for changing. First, we have point at my wife, an unimpressive response. Now we have blame mommy. Okay. <laughs> blame mommy. Let's all take a deep breath. Oh, yes, once I pass 30, let's quit blaming mommy here. <laughs> yeah, that blame mommy thing gets old. Okay, about two more questions. Anybody else? Yes, talk loud. You said you work with the Goldman Sachs people? Yes, I do. You told them to just forget about all they did? I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. Yeah. I'm going to help you. <laughs> Have you ever tried to change the behavior of someone that had no interest in changing? Yes. How well did that work out? <laughs> what are the odds I'm going to make someone from Goldman Sachs feel guilty about making money? 
<laughs> Dream on. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> yeah. So how often in your work do you find management people who are associated? I, I, I don't. Can you do anything about them? Uh, I don't. I don't. I, I, you see, I only work with people who fit a profile. They have to be motivated to change. They have to want to change. I'm often asked the question, do people in general who are leaders want to do what I teach? I don't know. I only work with the ones that care. The ones that don't care, if I thought they were social best, I wouldn't work with them. So it's, you know, I can't say, I can't answer your question because I don't know enough. Yes? So how do you change the behavior of people around you that if they're perceiving things as surviving or yeah. uh, sacrificing to make them feel like that is also part of succeeding. Meaning, if you're, if you're doing things that you think are chores, but if yes. you can change your perspective, like gardening you said, if you change yeah. your perspective, it might be succeeding, right? Yes. So how do you make people feel that way, I mean, people that work Well, number team? one, I don't think you can make people feel anyway. Uh, in my coaching, I don't try to make anybody do anything. See, my theory in life, the one deepest learning I've had since I saw you three years ago is very simple learning. I can't make anyone change. I make no effort to make anyone change anymore. I can help people change what in their heart they want to change. I make no effort to make people change what they don't want to change. They don't, they don't want to change. I just take a deep breath and let it go. Let it go. Any of you still trying to behave, change the behavior of a husband, wife, or partner who has no interest in changing? <laughs> I'll look at her. Let it go. Let it go. Very good. Either let it go or let him go. What do you No matter what, he's my master. So. Let it go. Let it go. Yeah. Make him happy. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah, not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, I try to get people to change themselves, but I can't make anyone change. The client I coach that I spent the least amount of time with, this client improved the most. The client I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all and I didn't get paid. The client I spent the least amount of time with who improves the most, Alan Mulally, is now the CEO of Ford Motor Company. I talked to Alan. I said, Alan, I have a degree in math. I have a chart. I spent less time with you than anyone I ever coached. You were great to start with and you improved the most. And I had a chart. Time spent with Marshall Goldsmith, improvement. Inc. I said, according to this chart, had you never met me, you would really be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, what should I ask you? What should I learn from you? He said, Marshall, your biggest job in life as a coach is client selection. You pick the right clients, you win, right? <laughs> you pick the wrong clients, you lose. I think CK figured this out as well, right? It's all about the clients, right? Back to your point, I don't work with the wrong clients. I, I can get paid, I lose, right? And he said, I'm not that different. I've got to manage people. If they're not great, I'm not going to be a good leader. And he said, second, don't make coaching about your own ego. Make it about your clients. The biggest problems with all the coaches that I try to help, ego coach. We want, to, we want people to get better so I can look in the mirror and feel good about me. It's not about them. It's about my own need to prove how smart and special and wonderful I am. Very hard to get over our own ego and realize if other people are going to get better, it's really about them, it's not about us. And the more we can get over that, I think the more effective we can become. By the way, a very hard lesson. And it's one that I seldom master myself. A very hard lesson. You're a coach, right? Have you ever fallen into this disease? Only a few dozen times. How about you? Oh, yeah, we, we all do that. We all do that, right? Always fallen into this disease. Okay, anything else before we wrap up? Yes. You're a Buddhist. Yes. Can you explain the difference between a Zen Buddhist and who perfects the art right. versus just getting happy and then you try to turn it into a Yeah, I'm a very easygoing Buddhist. <laughs> now, to start with, I just said I'm a Buddhist. I didn't say I was a good Buddhist. Now, let's not go too far here. <laughs> I just said I'm a Buddhist, right? Well, there are many schools of Buddhist thought. I will share my school. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. Given that Buddha said that, the variations in Buddhist thought are just huge. If you take Christians, the difference between a Southern Baptist and a Catholic and a Unitarian are huge. Differences in Buddhists are even bigger. So I'm not going to tell you what a Buddhist should or should not be. I mean, nobody happened to make me God this week, so I'm not really qualified to say that. I can tell you my interpretation. My interpretation of Buddhism is very simple. This is heaven. This is hell. This is nirvana. It's not out there. It's in here. It's not next week. It's not next month. It's now. Where's nirvana? 
Nirvana's in the women's club at La Jolla, California. Yeah. <laughs> That's where it is. It's right here and it's right now. On that note, since we're already in Nirvana, let's take a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please uh, wait for a minute. If you would just uh, give us a couple more minutes so that, uh, uh, Marshall, could I ask you to come closer to the <laughs> As a token of our esteem and our thanks for doing this. And that is a Thai charter member, as our other charter members. Can I just ask Oh, wait a minute. One thing I did forget. Free books for everybody with a request. Let's all dig deep and make a little donation to Ty. Is that a good idea? Or become a member. Or become a member. With your credit card. To your Mark's consent, reach into your pockets, pull out some money, and put it on the table. Go, 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 go. <laughs> it's all for a good cause. We, um, just so you know, uh, this goes to organizing more events. If you are interested, besides the, the uh, encouragement that you just got from Marshall um, to contribute um, if you are not a member, um, we also try to get you Die Institute events that uh, teach the entrepreneur. And in addition, for those of you who may not have come before, there's been such events, uh, uh, Dr. Prahlad and uh, the smart devices recently, the, the Dr. Carl Hull talk, all of these are available on the site. I think the, site, the link will go up shortly. All of those videos are archived and, and quickly available uh, to members. We're trying to help membership. Uh, and again, you look at the caliber of the charter members here, there's several of them I can see in the room. Um, I won't ask them to stand up at this point, but uh, uh, these are people who give back of their time to help. And we have some charter members from Silicon Valley and other chapters here as well. So again, uh, I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, please uh, do uh, look at this flyer for the Ashok Rao talk, which is our next event and uh, do consider joining us for the gala on the 10th anniversary when we have the US CTO and the California CTO. And I believe the San Diego CIO is going to be also in the audience, besides uh, Dr. Prahlad and Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. Thank you again. Thank you.